happiness. What is happiness? Happiness is different for many people. Happiness is a place that you arrive to. Happiness is a place that you find. Happiness is a place that you seek, but it's also a place that you determine. Who am I? What makes me happy? What things are involved in my happiness and what people are a part of that process, a part of that period and a part of that time. Happiness can be a quest. It can be a journey. You may find partial happiness in things. You may find partial happiness in people, but we are all in search of collective happiness. And part of that search is understanding what it is and what it is not as we journey through life as we journey through stages certain stages are not happiness but they also define our future happiness what were we tolerating before that we are not going to tolerate again and make ourselves happy happiness is an overwhelming feeling that leads to a lifelong search and process happiness is a discovery and i invite you on a journey of watching so many people get there stay tuned and see you there so thank you jermaine for taking this opportunity to speak with me in my ministry about depression mental illness uh aces which are i'll let you explain exactly what that is for people who do not know and the life that impacts athletes and life beyond the hardwood is, is the foundation that he has and life beyond the hardwood and life beyond whether it's a field, turf, the the courts, life behind the athleticism that people do not get a chance to see and how different things, whether it's finances, mental health affects athletes as well as it can help impact uh, the regular person who's taken a fall from any sort of financial situation. I know Jermaine will mainly speak on behalf of, of athletes, but there are other people who can also identify with a lot of his experiences. And I thank you so much for coming on to talk about your foundation and your purpose and your mission today. Well, I appreciate you having me. Uh, you know, for those who don't know, my name is Jumaine Jones. A lot of people call me Jermaine um, throughout the year. So I have to correct, you know, you get tired of correcting people so much, but there's no R, uh, it's Jumaine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Born and raised in Cocoa, Florida. Uh, ended up moving to a small town called Camilla, Georgia. Went to high school there. Uh, went to the University of Georgia for two years. Uh, and I decided to enter the NBA draft. Mm -hmm. uh, spent two years with the 76ers, two years in Cleveland. Uh, spent the year in Boston, year with the Lakers, year in Charlotte, year in Phoenix. Uh, you know, kind of a journeyman. Uh, ended up spending four years in Italy. Year in Israel, year in Bulgaria, year in Russia, uh, and, and my last season was in Mexico. So I've been well traveled there, and uh, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, retired in uh, 2015. And you know, from that time, uh, I know we talked about, um, you know, we're gonna talk about a lot of the stuff that you know I went through. Uh, so in 2015, I went into like a depression. You know, after the basketball stopped bouncing for me. Um, and it's and it's and it's, it's pretty common with athletes, you know, when you've been playing basketball most of your life, um, you know, with anybody, if you've been doing something for a certain amount of time, um, and it comes to an end, you know, it's going to affect you in some kind of way. Um, for me, I really wasn't really ready to face the fact that basketball was over for me. So, so after after it ended, you know, I went into this depression that lasted three years, and I had no clue that I was into this depression. Uh, I was at home every single day drinking, um, drinking every day, not ready to face the fact, you know, drinking, falling asleep, waking up to the same problems and starting over doing the same thing again. Um, you know, before I knew it, it was three years past me, but I was big on not bringing my negative energy around anybody. I was embarrassed about a lot of things that I had went through. Um, I was scared to even have a conversation about you know, the issues I was having with the game. And, and uh, you know, luckily, uh, by the grace of God, man, I got a phone call one day and somebody told me, like, Jermaine, the NBA is having a transitioning program uh, for, for NBA players. And, you know, at this point, like, I have no purpose in life. I've been an athlete my entire life. So I'm, I'm looking like, you know, what am I going to do now? Mm -hmm. 
So I get a phone call to kind of help me with my transition. And they was asking me about a um, resume. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, resume? Right. <laughs> <laughs> like I play <laughs> basketball. <laughs> like I've been an athlete my whole life. So I didn't really understand like what that meant. So, mm -hmm. and, and it's funny because it's pretty much like starting over like a, a, a young kid all over again, because I'm learning things. Um, uh, I was going into the NBA offices for three months, um, going in at nine and, and, and checking out at five and going into these NBA meetings where I, I kind of found out, uh, you know, the business side of basketball, which I never knew during the time I was playing, mm -hmm. which I thought was very intriguing for me to go in and find out. Like most people that work for the NBA never played basketball before. You know, most of them were attorneys and, you know, into, you know, a lot of politics and stuff like that. And, the business you know, kind of, threw me, kind of threw me for a loop. Yeah. So for me to go into the meetings and they were so excited to have me in there to be able to give my opinions on how to make the NBA better. And mm -hmm. it was like, you know, weird that, you know, that I was there to be able to give my input. And just going through that experience from nine to five, had to put on a suit. And, and it was difficult in the beginning because I'm like, man, people do this every day. Right. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Like I've been, you know, we go to practice two, three hours and, you know, that's pretty much, you know, mm -hmm. the gist of our day. Of course, we travel in, in uh, you know, four or five games out of the week and stuff like that can be real strenuous. But to be actually, um, you know, in a suit. Nine mm -hmm. to five was different for me, mm -hmm. um, but I adjusted very quickly because I was intrigued by a lot of stuff that was going on mm -hmm. uh, in the offices. And the only reason I wanted to go through this process is because that I knew that I was going through something and I need to try to find something else to be able to deter myself. And, and I actually went to to this program and, and a guy by the name of Vin Baker that I played with. Um, you know, I was actually having a conversation with him and I'm asking him, like, man, how was your transition? And he was like, man, it was bad for me. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was like, well, what did you do? He was like, man, it was tough. He said, man, one of the things I had to realize is that, man, do you know what it took for us to make the NBA? And I said, absolutely. And he was like, well, that goes nowhere. That's still in us. Mm -hmm. He was like, we just got to find somewhere else to apply it to. And from just having that conversation with him, like, opened my mind to so much. And, um, you know, I just started thinking about a lot of writing down a lot of things that I really, really enjoyed doing. Mm -hmm. And all of them kind of re resorted back to helping people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that kind of gave me, you know, a path to try to figure out, you know, going and working with the youth. And, you know, basketball is always going to be my passion to mm -hmm. be able to talk with kids about that kind of stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that you know, grew me to having a job and, and um, you know, getting offers with the 76ers youth program, mm -hmm. which really made me feel a lot better about myself. Now, mm -hmm. You know, I have a schedule to do things and, and, and kind of, uh, and and then I decided uh, to move back to Atlanta after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I moved back to Atlanta and, um, you know, it was a little tougher for me to find a job. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after that, it kind of, you know, the depression kind of snuck back in on me. So do you mind if I go uh, uh, backwards to a couple of things that you yes, mentioned? Yes, absolutely. Uh, how, first, how old were you when you started playing professional basketball? I know I met you about 20-something years ago. You're playing with the Cleveland Ca Cavaliers. <laughs> yeah. How old were you then? I know you were a little younger than me, but how old? Uh, I, I got drafted at 19 years old. 19, okay. You mentioned when you were uh, discussing the gentleman that you just referenced, uh, something that's in you that gets you in the NBA. What is that? Was is that would that be a drive or some sort? Oh, of... it was a drive. The work ethic. You know, um, you know, from the time I picked up a basketball, I fell in love with it, and mm -hmm. from that day, you know, I knew what I wanted to do. I mm -hmm. knew that I wanted to play in the NBA at the highest level, and mm -hmm. nothing was going to deter me from that. So my drive and willingness to be able to sacrifice, you know, hanging out with the right people, not being around, like, anybody that wasn't on that same path with me, I couldn't be friends with you or hang out with you. Mm -hmm. Most of my friends were, you know, athletes. Mm -hmm. You know, you you was, had some kind of, you know, drive to be able to reach another level, and those are the kind of people I surrounded myself with, and, it, and, it, and it's tough at such a young age, but I, you know, I was just blessed to be able to have that drive and, you know, once I had something in my mind that I wanted to do, there was nothing going to deter me from that. So I guess, you know, what was in me was my drive and willingness because from the first day I touched the basketball, I never missed a day out of the gym. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So going back to, you mentioned moving to Atlanta and things being different. 
did you what do you mind if I ask what was what did your life look like prior to being 19 years old playing for a professional team being in the Sixers Cavaliers what what did your youth look like? Did you like, have a regular job or were you just like, what type of student were you? What was life like for you prior to that? Um, prior, prior, prior to making the NBA, it was a grind. Mm -hmm. You know, from, you know, I I touched the basketball for, um, at 11 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, and from that time, you know, in the off season, like when I wasn't in school, like I would go to the gym in the morning times when they was opening up the gym and, you mm -hmm. know, I had to be home before the street lights came on. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, like, like during during the summertime, that was my day every day. Yeah. And then yeah. you know when school school was in, and you know I was going to basketball court, mm -hmm. finding me a court to get on right after school. You know, mm -hmm. so that was just pretty much you know my, my thing to do to get better. You know, I wasn't so good. And eleven years old it was really late to start playing basketball, mm -hmm. and uh, I was already behind. And and it was kind of yeah. like you know I found out. You know, I guess the athlete in me, when when all my friends are, were surrounded by me and telling me how horrible I was, <laughs> <laughs> and and from then, like from that age, I already knew like to hear anything negative, I always wanted to turn it into a positive. Mm -hmm. So you know, mm -hmm. I kind of used that throughout my process. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then we we get to you going to Atlanta. Now, is this after after the NBA, after playing professional basketball, that you went to Atlanta, or was it prior to? No, this this was after this was after I retired in 2015. Um, you know, I, it was it was uh, I was at a point where, you know, me me and my ex wife, uh, you know, we broke it off, mm -hmm. and I found it tough for me to be in a city where you know I didn't have any family mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. You know, I mm -hmm. just had my kids, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the relationship wasn't going the way I wanted. So I felt like the best thing for me to do was just get away from it for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to uh, I went to Atlanta, and mm -hmm. uh, things just wasn't you know as opening as Philadelphia was for me mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. when it pertaining to jobs and uh, things moving as fast as I wanted them to. Mm -hmm. Now, just to touch on, I know we're going to get into relationships and how depression and even being in professional sports how that impacts relationships. And I don't want to, you know, divulge too much of your uh, business with your spouse, but would you say that um, anything with depression or just being an athlete and, and no longer being an athlete, did that have any impact on your relationship at the time? Does it, uh, let's just be, be fair to, to take it off of this person. Would you say that, you know, the, the process or things that have happened or does it make it difficult for relationships going through these transitions? Well, for me, um, I'm pretty sure it's different for everybody, but, um, you know, being a professional athlete uh, has has a lot to do with it. Um, also, my upbringing had a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I learned once I started going to counseling. Um, I found out that, you know, I had aunts that actually dated married men, mm -hmm. you know, growing up through my childhood, which I always seen. And mm -hmm. it was like three or four of my aunts that dated married married men so from that young age you know that's all i seen mm -hmm. so that always registered in my mind it was always hard for me to trust any female mm -hmm. and you know just carrying that over um in my mind like i never really wanted to put my everything into any relationship mm -hmm. because i never trusted it because of what i went through throughout my childhood and mm -hmm. the things that i seen so that alone made you know a block on, on my mind to be even, you know, fall in love with somebody. You know, I always had that wall up where, you know, yes, I dated, yes, I was, you know, seeing people, but, you know, far as me just falling in love and giving my all into a relationship was very tough on me simply because of what I grew up seeing. Mm -hmm. So I know your platform deals a lot with uh, ACEs. I know a lot of people may not know what that acronym stands for. Do you mind explaining what ACEs are and how that they have or the trauma has impacted your life? Um, well, AC, ACE is a adverse childhood experiences. Um, it's very, very big um, when you're talking about mental health and mental wellness. Because when I um, when I retired and, and when I came to Atlanta, that's when I started to decide that you know, you know what, man, I'm, you know, I'm going through a lot. I've been doing a lot. You know, I want to get back to being a father, the friend, you know, 
the person that I had been throughout my whole life. So I went to counseling. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, once I went to counseling, I started finding, like I went because I felt like I was stressed out about a lot of things that was going on. And when I went to counseling, I found out a whole lot of stuff about my childhood, mm-hmm. you know, which is ACEs. Um, you know, I, I found out, you know, all the trauma that I went through that just wasn't normal that mm-hmm. I was carrying on with me. Like, you know, I was I, I was gave up for adoption when I was younger. Okay. And, you know, I didn't know that, like, how much that affected me. You know, I just mm-hmm. thought that was normal stuff. My mom came back and got me, but she kept my sister. Mm-hmm. So that alone had me have abandonment issues. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, no, going through that process and then, you know, um, finally connecting back with my mom and my sister. And then every weekend, my, my sister's father would come and get her every weekend. And then my dad was never around. Yeah. So going through that process where like, man, like, what's wrong with me? Yes. You know, at a very young age, I'm thinking it's a problem with me. Like nobody yeah. cares about me, you know, yeah. so and going through that process. And, you know, my grandmother had her favorite grandson yeah. and no one could touch him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was always something where I never felt wanted mm-hmm. or nobody, uh, you know, wanted me around. Even when I found the sport of basketball, you know, I always had my basketball everywhere and everywhere I went, people would be like, man, don't bring that basketball up here making all that noise. <laughs> And I'm like, man, why am I the only person nobody wants around? So just mm-hmm. growing up in that atmosphere uh, made it made it very, very tough on me. And I didn't know how much it affected me. Um, you know, even witnessing murder at 13 years old, mm-hmm. I didn't under, like I didn't know how much that affected me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, my mom in an abusive relationship, you know, uh, growing up, you know, with a guy who used to beat her all the time, every single day. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't. You know, then my sister moved around because he ended up molesting my sister mm-hmm. and my mom stayed around with him. So all of this kind of stuff like was was in me and all this anger and all that kind of stuff was just built in me. And I didn't understand any of it until I went to counseling. Sure. And and once I went to the counseling, uh, it brought it all to my attention. I was like, man, I've been going through a lot. Mm-hmm. And then I learned that I was using basketball as a coping skill. Sure. That was like my safe space. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think one thing that I noticed is that you you tied into was the how the, you know, being an athlete or, or playing basketball gave you that what people call a role identity. It gave you a purpose. It gave you a, a different, I guess, a perception to other people that was contrary to what you felt on the inside. And when those things come together, obviously that you know these things happen. The, the brain is processing the trauma, but yet this other person that starts to exist, presents to someone else, and then there's these other things going on on the inside. How old were you when you started counseling? Uh, oh, was I? I'm 43 now. Um, counseling, I started in 2017. Okay. And do you mind saying what, I guess, what pivotal moment happened where you realized therapy is something that I either need or would help my situation? Um, I, I found myself um, closing myself off to the world and it didn't really feel good. Mm-hmm. Um, even to, you know, my family, to my kids, you know, I wasn't the person like, you know, financially, I wasn't in the place that, you know, I once was, mm-hmm. you know, and I always was a person to try to spoil my daughters and give them everything they wanted. And then it came to a point where I couldn't. So, um, you know, just going through the process where I had to face them and tell them no, because mm-hmm. I never... You know, I always was thinking in my mind, like, man, I got to make it tougher on the guys that's dating them. <laughs> you know, so I always wanted to make sure they had anything that they needed. Right. And and when I couldn't be able to supply that, you know, you know, that made a lot more stress on me to be mm-hmm. able to not be the father that I once was. And, and not saying that me being able to buy things for them, but, you know, I was yeah. more embarrassed to be in front of them, not to be able to do the things. Not that they wouldn't accept me for who I am, but it's just how it made me feel, sure. um, you know father and and going through that process and and uh seeing how how many people i affected that i was taking care of you know mm-hmm. because people don't understand like you you can enable people and make their lives bad yeah. and and you know realizing that and, and, and people that don't want to be friends with me anymore because i'm not in a position to help anymore mm-hmm. that became a lot more stress on me mm-hmm. so you know it was a lot that was going on that i was like man this is just too much on me i just need to have a conversation with somebody mm-hmm. 
did those did this process of of I guess after basketball, after the Hartwood, or, or taking a financial hit, did that trigger some of the early traumas that you had experienced, feeling like maybe not good enough or not uh, appreciated enough, or the some of the some of the prior periods that you spoke of with your childhood? Um, well, you know, you know, poverty and, and, and finances is, is a part of ACES. Yes. You know, a yes. lot of people go through, you know, uh, poverty, sexual abuse, racism, mm -hmm. divorce, um, neglect, domestic violence. You know, mm -hmm. it's a lot of things that goes on down through that list. And, and yes, financial, financial is one of those things that can trigger, you know, a lot that, that's been piled on you throughout the years. Mm hmm. Were there periods of time where you were depressed? Yes, I was. I was depressed, man, and and and, it, and it's crazy because, um, you know, going through that time, it was tough. I always felt like I was by myself. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't have anybody that I can call on. Uh, all, all the friends that I had, you know, you know, I, I think I was more embarrassed to even have those kind of conversations with them because I was always the guy that's cracking the jokes and yeah. you know laughing and having. <laughs> fun you mm -hmm. know like how am I supposed to transform myself to have these serious conversations with my friends so mm -hmm. I didn't feel and then you know I didn't trust anybody just being a professional athlete you kind of block people off mm -hmm. to be able to have those kind of conversations so it was kind of like I was going through this process all alone mm -hmm. and and that that really really made it tough on me and then going through the process where you know dealing with child support issues that mm -hmm. I had you know what I mean? I had issues, you know, with child support issues, even when I was playing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So to be able to still have to face that when, you know, things are not going the same and, and, and things are not the same, uh, you know, that, that was tough. It, it was mm -hmm. tough going through that process. Things got real dark, mm -hmm. real fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wanted to uh, share a moment because I know I know you to be a wounded healer. Um, when I met you, it was just probably like, you know, 20 something years ago I'll just not put a year to it <laughs> and uh, you were playing with the Cleveland Cavaliers and I you know, didn't want to tell you what was going on didn't want to tell anybody uh, what was going on I know I felt suicidal at that time a lot of stress I had lost my career at the time and uh, you had called and uh, what I, of course I didn't want to tell you because of who you are I didn't want to tell anybody anyway and it was something that you heard in my voice and you said I'm flying you out to Cleveland for a change of environment and if it wasn't for that weekend or those few days, I probably would not even be here. Are you able to say, if there's something that you can sense in a person's voice, is there something that resonates with you when you come across someone who's been depressed? Well, being somebody that's been through the process and somebody that kind of understands it, mm -hmm. um, even, even with my friends now, when I call them, I ask like, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. and, and they'd be like, I'm good. And I, and, I, and I repeat it. I was like, no, but like, how are you doing? Yeah. It was like, I'm good. And I, I repeat it like three or four times because I understand like how hard it is sometimes for people to have that conversation. And, uh, you know, I'm just big on, you know, just trying to figure it out. If someone, you know, I call somebody and, and I can sense something is not right. Uh, I've been very good about, uh, you know, sensing things. And, and people always come to me like, man, how did you know something was going on? And most of the time mm -hmm. I don't. It's just yeah. the fact that, you know, I'm always, uh, you know, pressed to make sure, you know, people that I love and people that I care about uh, are doing well because I know the things that I've went through. And, and I was at the point where I didn't want to talk. And that's why I do what I do now and speak out and very transparent about a lot of things I went through so people can understand that it's okay not to be okay. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Just be able to have that conversation with people to try to, you know, resolve some of the things that you're going through because being quiet about it really doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Now, have you ever been suicidal yourself? Uh, well, I, I had never been suicidal until I, I got arrested. Okay. Um, uh, through the child support uh, issues that I had, I got sentenced to 18 months in jail. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent 18 months in jail. And, and you're talking about somebody who dedicate their life uh, to be able to stay out of trouble and not mm -hmm. hang around people that's going to put you in those kind of positions. So mm -hmm. I had never been in jail before in my life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to see my family going in, you know, throughout my childhood, you know, that was normal things. And that's one of the things that I put on myself that I would never do anything to go to jail. And uh, to go in there and, you know, be surrounded by people that I, I wouldn't say that everybody should be there, but 
the stories that I was listening to while I was mm-hmm. in there was very, very depressing. And mm-hmm. I felt like, you know, being surrounded, even though, you know, when they picked me up, you know, they put me in a van. I got my my legs shackled. I got arms shackled mm-hmm. like, you know, like I was a real criminal and yeah. was actually next to somebody that had just got life in prison. Mm-hmm. Like, like, why am I next to somebody that, that has life? Yeah. What if he wakes up one day and has a, you know, a bad uh, day? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so for me, uh, you know, that was tough to be able to be in there. And then the county that I was in was like the top five worst counties in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so every single day I was waking up thinking like, man, I, I'm thinking about trying to end it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just because it was just too much on being closed in there, probably, um, to be honest with you, it probably one of the worst times of my life, but you know, looking at it right now, it's probably one of the best times of my life because it kind of stopped me from moving around mm-hmm. and being able to sit down and be able to focus in on the things that I wanted to do once I got out. But my early, my early first six months in there, I, I definitely uh, contemplated uh, committing suicide until I started ordering, you know, a lot of uh, self-help books. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was ordering so many of those and reading and start reading more and reading more and reading more then you know I, I kind of you know I wouldn't say comfortable because it's never comfortable being in jail yeah. but you know I felt better about being in there and kind of you know start talking with a lot of people and, and bringing my positive energy to the guys that was in there. Do you mind saying roughly how many years ago that was? Uh, that was in um, 2000 I say I got out because I always tell people like, man, this, this you got to be kidding me. Uh, <laughs> I got out, I got out um, when the pandemic started. I was okay. like, okay, I got out of jail and went <laughs> where I have you to know? be almost incarcerated again. <laughs> now everything else is shut down. <laughs> right. <laughs> Funny, I had surgery before the before the pandemic, so even though it's something a little different, I, I understand exactly how it feels. Like now that I can move around, everything shut down. It's just it does something to you. Like wow. Um, right. your, your foundation is called Beyond the Hardwood. What are some of the obstacles that, other obstacles that you had in over, overcoming um, leaving professional sports and adjusting to a life outside of basketball? Uh, well, well, Beyond the Hardwood is more, you know, for the kids. Um, you know, one of the things that I try to vent on with the kids about, you know, because I can hold a camp and, and it can be a hundred kids and I can ask the kids what do they want to do when they grow up and 95% of the kids going to say NBA or NFL or some mm-hmm. kind of sport. Mm-hmm. So what Beyond the Hardwood is about to explain to these kids about, you know, the 1% chance of making mm-hmm. the NBA, speaks to them about other, uh, you know, other jobs around the game that, you know, because a lot of these kids really, really love basketball and they really, really passionate about football and, and a lot of sports they're passionate about. So what I try to do is guide them and, and uh, not try to scare them and, and, and tear down their dreams, but to try to build them up and let them know how important it is to have a plan B and a plan C just in case, you know, that doesn't work out for you. And if you love the game of basketball or football or whatever sport it is, you know, I, I bring to them, uh, you know, other job opportunities that are that are surrounding the game that, that most people don't have conversations about. <laughs> like the mm-hmm. mascots make mm-hmm. six figures. I don't mm-hmm. think a lot of people know that mascots make six figures, but he's surrounded, you know, by the game and entertaining mm-hmm. people and he makes six figures. <laughs> and, and they normally love basketball. You right. know, people that around, you know, doing pulling the cores and you know, wrapping up the course and making two hundred thousand dollars. People uh-huh. that's doing Shaquille O'Neal and Dennis Scott's makeup making two hundred thousand uh-huh. dollars. So these are kind of things I try to bring bring forward to the kids and let them understand. You know, it's bigger than the game. You know, so many other job opportunities around, and also to let them understand that no matter how talented you are. Um, you know, you still have to be able to go to school and do well. You still have to be well-rounded and, sure. and you have to be able to be disciplined. You have to be self-disciplined. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you want to go and work out, you're just telling them, you know, things that that's around the game that a lot of kids don't really look at. So that's what Beyond the Hard, what is mainly about, uh, you know, to address a lot of the youth, um, you know, about that's, that's getting into sports or any, mm-hmm. any, any, um, any field, you know, it doesn't have to be sports. It can be, you know, if you want to be a doctor, the, the dedication that it's going to have to take, the time that you're going to have to invest in, 
Do you know how many other doctors that people that want to be doctors? Yeah. Do you know how many people that want to play in the NBA? Do you know it's for only 450 NBA players every year? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what are you doing different to be able to make yourself a part of that 1%? So just putting things on their mind, speaking to them about financial literacy, you know, because a lot of these kids have dreams of being millionaires. Like, yeah. like, what would you do? Like, I like to ask them, what are you going to do once you get that million? Yeah. And then I hear these outlandish things that they say, and it's funny to me. So I kind of, you know, go into that. And, and a lot of things that's, you know, not only about basketball, but kind of, you know, featuring the things that they need to be knowing. Uh, you know, whatever they are successful in. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'd like to share uh, uh, information from an article that I read and uh, doing some research for it, for the segment. They mentioned that uh, this is an article on CNBC, uh, that 60% of uh, NBA players, you know, take a financial fall. I don't want to use the word that they use. Um, it basically, it says 60% uh, of NBA players uh, fall in financial strain. Um, and 78% of these experiences uh, happen within two years of retirement. Do you mind talking about that? I mean, I don't want to blame any organization, but did, was there any preparation or any uh, career advice or financial uh, information that you had prior to, during and after that you wish you might have had when you were 19 or, or whatever age you were when you started playing basketball? Well, uh, well, I'll say this because I, I only can speak off my experience and a lot, I think everybody's situation was different. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of my financial woes because my, after my first four years in the NBA, I was dead broke. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any money. Um, mm -hmm. But I was a 19-year-old kid that came from a family of 16 aunties and uncles mm -hmm. with 100,000 first cousins. Yeah. Um, and everybody would help. <laughs> Half of my aunts dropped out, you know, half of my aunts and uncles dropped out in middle school and, you know, maybe one or two of them may have, may have graduated, but nobody had the education enough to be able to teach me about finances. Nobody had businesses. Nobody I can look up to that actually, you know, probably made over $30,000. Mm -hmm. You know, I came from that kind of upbringing. And then, you know, they wasn't teaching about financial literacy in school as well, you know, at that time. So I was a 19-year-old kid that signed my first contract for $650,000 and I thought I was rich. Right. I had no clue about, you know, Uncle Sam. I didn't right. know who he was. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, we like, all find out, don't we? <laughs> and, and then, you know, uh, and the NBA was doing some things, uh, you know, they had the first week where, you know, this week-long class where they try to push all this information on you in a week and I you know who's paying attention in these classes right. out the first two days after you right. finish school and all that kind of stuff so some of that information may have been given but I guarantee you most of the most of the guys that was going through that process after day two to kind of lost lost uh you know all the things but but through my through my time like you know the six hundred fifty thousand dollars. The first thing I did, I you know, I bought my mom a house, bought my mom a car, bought my sister mm -hmm. a house, bought my my sister. I didn't buy myself anything at all mm -hmm. because I was never moved by money, and uh, it seemed like everybody that was around me was. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was giving people what made them happy, mm -hmm. and I was trying to save my entire family with six hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Mm -hmm. And what people don't understand, and what what I didn't understand, was that. Um, you know, let's just say I'm making a million dollars. I didn't understand that, you know, Uncle Sam get 50% of that. I didn't understand that the NBA takes 10% back, you know, for your retirement. I didn't understand that my agent gets 4% of that. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you, you, you're you making, uh, you know, $360,000 when your contract says a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was paying $7,500 a month for one kid in child support. Mm -hmm. That's just one. And, mm -hmm. you know, at the time while I was playing with my uh, tenure in the NBA, I had three kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just think about that $7,500 a month for one kid. I was paying $3,000 a month for one kid. So, you know, the money uh, trickles down. And, 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 yes, family is always good and, and uh, you know, having kids, but it's expensive. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so a lot of these factors, nobody really had these kind of conversations with you. And I do, uh, you know, I, what I can say about the NBA now, they're really preparing these guys now um, and, and helping them transition during the time that they're playing while they can still make phone calls and get into any space that they want to get into. Mm -hmm. So I think they're doing a better job now, but it took a whole lot of us 
during my tenure and, you know, a little after me to go through that process. And the NBA came in and, uh, you know, got tired of seeing it. So so they're doing a, a lot better job now, even though they're making a whole lot more money <laughs> than, than what we make. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it seems like I'm blaming any any organization. I'm just <laughs> questioning, you know, based upon my research, I know Fox Business cited it as three years after retirement. And uh, two t- two takeaways that were, were cre- credited in, in the article was that one is uh, making so much money in a short period of time that, you know, it seems like the, the finances will last forever. And then the other one was helping family and helping people that were there for you when you were growing up. I noticed on one of the... Uh, post on your Facebook page, uh, speaking to children, you had mentioned, you know, helping family. How does that um, inhibit or, or, or impact a family and your relationships as well as your finances? Well, I think it's a way to do it now. Uh, you know, and that's one of the things I speak with kids about when they talk about, well, I'm going to help my family do this. I'm going to help my family do that. And, and I talk to them. And I'm like, well, how about trying to find out what your family really want to do? and what their interests are to be able to build something for themselves so they're not coming to you every month to try to find out, you know, trying to get money and and taking from you every month. Let's invest. If you really, you know, want to invest in somebody, invest in something that they want to do where they can, you know, bring income for themselves, where Mm -hmm. it's not coming out of your pocket every month because that can get, that can get real, um, you know, once that money keep coming out and coming out and coming out, like I sat down, you know, after my first four years and I was in, I was in the red, mm-hmm. I was in the red almost over a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Was it, it after retirement or? No, no. After my first four years. Okay. Because, because as long as you have a contract, you can get mm-hmm. money from mm-hmm. anywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I was spent, I had spent over the money that I had and, and, uh, was in the red a million dollars mm-hmm. and, you know, once I went through that process and sat down and tried to figure out who wasn't going to get money anymore and who wasn't going through that process, yes, I, I started losing family. I started losing friends. But, you know, the four years it took me getting into that debt, it took me four years to get out of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so, you know, the eight years I spent in the NBA, um, you know, the eight years I spent, you know, I was basically at zero when that ended. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And how did how did that how does that I think I, I know my experience in the are is even as vast as yours. How does that impact you psychologically to to you know, take such a, a financial hit and then have to pretty much start all over? Um, <laughs> I, I know this probably not be the right thing to say, but I'm I'm transparent and open and talk about a lot of things. But I grew mm-hmm. up with nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's more. Um, it's just more for me what I'm not able to do for, you know, my family and kids and, you know, organizations that I used to do a lot for. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that was more hurtful for me rather than me not having. Because, mm-hmm. you know, money was something that just never moved me at all. You know, my goal was to make the NBA. I was happy. You mm-hmm. know, just being able to play at the highest level was the happiest day of my life Mm -hmm. and also the worst day of my life because I learned so much about people, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. like people just want to take, 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 take at 19 years old. I got to try to organize and watch people over here that I've got finance and my money that's doing all of this stuff for me that I'm paying. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. That's difficult to Mm -hmm. go through because I never had to trust anybody (laughs) (laughs) to the fact where, you know, they're having all this money. And you learn, you you learn that the people that, that that's working for you, they're stealing from you, you know. And then they're mm-hmm. linking up, connecting you with people like, oh yeah, you want a car? Yeah, I'm gonna hook you up with this guy. <laughs> they're hooking up all their friends. So by the time mm-hmm. you know, you, you you really start paying attention because people don't understand when you're playing four or five games out of the week. Like when do you when can you find time to be able to look over all of this kind of stuff? Because when you when you do get that time off, you really want to enjoy that time and not being able to have the you know, investigate people and you're hoping that you can trust them. Right. But, um, you know, you learn real fast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when, you, when you're getting that kind of money, it's tough and it can be strenuous on you. Would you suggest that, like, uh, other athletes coming uh, or, or whether, whatever point of tenure they are with their career, that they have a mentor, someone who's pretty much played already, someone who's been in the professional sports for a long time, that can give them guidance and explain the ropes in a sense? Well, I, I think it's more of that going on now 
and 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 what the crazy thing is, and I could never understand this. Um, you know, even when I was a young kid, um, the veterans that was on the team, it seemed like they would have been more helpful. Mm-hmm. You know, to the younger guys, kind of explaining them how things go. But it would seem like to me that, um, you know, a lot of them will stand away from that. But I do think like guys that have went went over that because now I've I've accepted a job with uh, Educor. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a financial uh, literacy group where I'll be coming in talking with a bunch of the first and second year NBA guys, speaking to them about my experiences and my finances throughout and being transparent about the things that happened to me. So I think they need more of that um, going on with guys that actually went through it. But a lot of guys are very, like, you'd be surprised. A lot of guys that went through that are still not in the space where they can have conversations about it, even though that they can help others by speaking out. And it's hard to find these guys. So, you know, if we, if we could find more people like myself that's getting out there doing that, uh, I think it will be better. And uh, even even with the, you know, with the amount of money these kids are getting now, you know, I, I think uh, LeBron James set a platform where, you know, the guys that he's working with, you know, all came to him, you know, mm-hmm. with degrees and the plan. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of people, you know, kind of looked up to that. Uh, you know, they, they do so much with, um, you know, with his team and, and promoting what they do and, and how they did it. I think mm-hmm. that's starting to trend now where people are getting better about uh, instead of coming with their hands out, they're coming with, you know, a plan. Sure. And I think that's going to always be helpful. Sure. I think that falls into the the stigma of depression. You know, when people are going through things, they don't feel comfortable talking about it, especially the higher you were or the more successful or financially uh, sound you were, the harder it is to probably admit that something's going wrong or that that you're not okay with it. Things have have, have fallen into a different state. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Because I, I know, um, you know, when I was going through – like after my at the end of my fourth year, I didn't have a dime. Mm-hmm. Like I was trying to figure out like how things were gonna work to you know my next contract got in mm-hmm. during the summertime, mm-hmm. and I was asking people for money that I had been giving money to, and nobody can help me. And that's when my mindset changed. Like okay, <laughs> right. nobody can help me. <laughs> right. Right. That hurts. I know that. I know that hurts. Now, I know you mentioned it in talking about this in another uh, segment that was on your, your Facebook page. You had mentioned that you wanted to be alone at that time. Can you talk a little bit more a little bit more about that? Uh, well, I think it was more because, like, anybody that knows me and has been around me, like, you know, I'm a ball of positive energy. Yeah. Like, when you're going through stuff yourself, you know, you don't really want to bring that bad energy around anybody. And I've always been that way. Um, you know, when I'm going through something, I disappear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, if you don't hear from me, that means like, hey, something must be going on with Jermaine. Yeah. You know, so uh, <laughs> so it was just more of me just shutting myself off, trying to get myself in order so that I could still be that person mm-hmm. to so many people that I'm, you know, you know, even being, you know, incarcerated, man, uh, you know, guys came up to me like, man, I've never been around uh, anybody as positive as you are. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, just to hear that, you know, always, you know, the reason why I keep going to be able to hear that from guys and be able to make make an impact on other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a time and without divulging too much of our of our history here and and you've moved on and have two two kids in the background that we can hear. And that's a a, a beautiful thing. There was a time uh, after a game a few years ago um, where. If anybody's ever been involved in an athlete, they you know think the worst when there's some disappearing. And I remember saying something, and you said, "If you want to know the truth, come get me." Uh, do you mind talking about where your world was at that time and where you were mentally? Because I know a lot of people were trying to help, but you were in a different you you were in a different place. Do you mind talking about that? Well, I, I think it more when you um, you've been a professional athlete and you've been doing so much throughout your life on your own, and you know every man and athlete has an ego right. and uh you know that's probably to be the death of most of us <laughs> you know what i mean so just to be able to um you know going through that process and thinking that you know you have all the answers and thinking like you know what i'm gonna do this on my own um you know you go into that zone where you know 
you you're always looking at you never want anybody to say that I wouldn't be in this position if you know if I didn't do this for Jermaine then he wouldn't be where he is today yeah. and something like that like was always in the back of my mind where I didn't really want to reach out for help and I didn't want to mm -hmm. you know give people the opportunity to be able to say what they did for me um and, and, and it probably was like one of the stupidest things that, you know, you could possibly, because I think everybody needs some help. I think as a man, you know, it just, you know, just one of the sticks was out, out for us, you know, where, mm -hmm. you know, we always feel like, you know, we're supposed to take care of everything and make sure to be the leader and, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. So when mm -hmm. things are going bad for us, you know, it's, it's tough unless we're going to counseling and as, men and black men we don't like to go to counseling yeah. so all of that comes down on us and and i think that's the kind of space that i was in at that time where you know it was dark and you know i didn't want to accept help or didn't even know how to accept help because yeah. i was doing so much on my own <laughs> yeah now i know that you know there were many people trying to help but you there was a level of shutdown there was a certain place that people could go but not too far did that feel safer for you being alone uh, me me going to counseling was my safe place mm -hmm. you know and and it, and it took me going to counseling probably for like two years before i actually um felt comfortable having conversations mm -hmm. um even like with my friends and i would go and have conversations with them they was like bro you was going through that that whole time and you never told me yeah. like why like why wouldn't you tell me and and you know the more i start opening up the more i felt better Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and that's why, you know, I hold these events where I'm speaking out and I bring other guys that's open enough to speak because I want other athletes to come around. I want other human beings that may be going through anything to be able to hear the stories so that, you know, even as athletes, if you go and watch somebody else that played or or, or, or is an athlete speaking mm -hmm. out on some things, you know, they're going to be like, man, you know what, if he did that, I can do that. And that encourages them to be able to have those conversations. And I tell them like, once you start having those conversations, that's when the healing starts. Mm -hmm. and, and and even now, you know, I feel like I'm in a place where I want to be, but I still, you know, it's therapeutic for me to go out and have these conversations, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with the world. So I try to get out as much, much as possible to, um, you know, talk with people and let them hear, you know, a lot of things that I experienced because a lot of people, they only see the glitz and the glamor of the yeah. NBA. They don't yeah. understand that we all been through something. Right. Uh, you know, we all have a story. Sure. And uh, that, that's one of the things with Ace. You know, I, I think most of the athletes that that's been through the NBA have had some experience with Aces. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that people in general know that those childhood experiences, they mold your personality. And they that trauma <laughs> will dictate how you handle situations and even how you view situations, your whole worldview and the things that are going on. Nine times out of 10, it's typically why I don't want to put a ratio on that. It's normally the result of that underlying trauma or early childhood experience that is either undealt with or not even recognized or just someone thinks they're okay or that didn't really affect me. And it, you know, the, the behavior, the presentation level of what happened will continue. And it, it, there's a saying that uh, your relationships will play out every trauma that you've had, <laughs> and they pretty much really do. So um, I know your platform talks about relationships as well. And, and going back for a second, what, is there a period, I don't know if you mind saying, is there a period of time where you were homeless at all, where you had nowhere to go, or yeah. nowhere you chose to go? Because I know I know plenty of people were, were helping you. I was, I was one, uh, but I... I um, would you say, I'll just let you answer that question. Would you say that you were homeless? <laughs> yes, I was absolutely. Uh, I was I was homeless after, um, you know, at, after 2015, I'd have a place to go. Mm -hmm. um, I end up, you know, calling one of my friends and, uh, you know, I was telling him, I say, look here, man, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to get into a place and, you know, I don't know how that's going to work, you know, me not having a job and no income. And uh, we end up moving in together. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't feel like, you know, it was my play, even though I had so many people living with me when I was, you know, in the NBA before mm -hmm. I got married. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it just didn't feel good me living with somebody where I actually depended on them to be able to pay half the bills. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, I felt homeless. And then, you know, after that happened, uh, 
2015, 2016, he found somebody that, you know, he he's married to today. And uh, so it was kind of like, you know, I moved in with my sister. Mm -hmm. I moved in with my sister who I took care of for so long. And I stayed with her for two or three years and, you know, just trying to figure life out and, uh, you know, going through the process of healing and, and, uh, you know, I just wasn't in the mind space. I wasn't in, my mind wasn't right to be able to go out and obtain any kind of job that, yeah. you know, took for me to be a professional, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, cause I just wasn't there when you're talking about mentally, uh, it was a lot of fixing that I had to do to be able to be in that space and, and, be, and to be homeless at that time. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just so much going on. You know, I had the child support issues going on. I was homeless. Uh, my kids needed things that I couldn't supply. Mm -hmm. uh, my family needed things I couldn't supply. Like, it was just so much that's going on uh, with me uh, at that time throughout that process. You know, homeless really was one of the things uh, more than anything because I didn't have a space that I can, you know, vent or, you know, just have that space where, you know, I can clear my mind. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was it was tough. It, mm -hmm. it was it was a tough process for me. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that uh, people with experiences, and I know I'm one of the people who AC, early ACEs typically become people pleasers. So maybe some of that desire to help and, and provide for people probably stem from some of the situations that you've had earlier, which is one of the beautiful things about you. But sounds like one of the things that sort of hurt as well as your finances, right? Yeah, I mean, things Things has been, uh, you know, like you said, a lot of the stuff that I went through is what I'm helping people with. You know, I just had meetings the other day where, you know, I could help, you know, families that's going through things because I did so much for the youth and getting the youth to talk about things and not keep them inside. But then they go home to broken homes. So then I have to, you know, make it a community thing and then they tell me about their finances and stuff like that so like i got went to a meeting the other day with some corporate people to be able to partner to be able to have some job opportunities for the families that are looking for jobs so you know i would definitely say a lot of the experiences i've had uh that's the thing that i'm helping with most right now what are some of the things and this is probably where your organization comes in that you wish you would have had that would have probably changed the outcome of your situation, whether it's intervention or a program? Um, I, uh, you know, so many different uh, parts, moving parts to the okay. things, but uh, I know one of the things that I got, uh, I got into was Fathers Incorporated. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things, one of the organizations that I got into uh, once I got out of jail because I wanted to be able to, you know, speak on a lot of the issues that are not right when you're talking about uh, people that want to be fathers and, and doing the best that they can. Because, you know, for me to get incarcerated for 18 months for a kid that wasn't mine, um, you know, it was a lot. And and then also with my son, you know, to, to pay the amount of money that I had paid and, and was continuously paying uh, was a lot, you know, on top of me. So I went through... You know, well, that's one of the things that when I got out of jail, I wanted to make sure that I wanted to represent a lot of fathers. Because here in the state of Georgia, um, you know, even if you're the father, you don't have the rights to your kids, mm -hmm. which I think is like absurd. Mm -hmm. Like, how can you have kids, but you don't have rights to them as a father? And that's and, and here in Georgia is one of the few states um, where that's happening. So I've been a part of a board where, you know, I try to make things better for the fathers because there's too many of us getting incarcerated for things that I think that, you know, that we shouldn't be um, and don't have the rights to kids and, and being able to have that visitation as, mm -hmm. as we should, because I missed opportunities with my son, who's 20 years old right now, most mm -hmm. of his life, because his mom didn't want me to be around him, um, mm -hmm. you know, but I was, you know, putting in all this cash every month for child support, but she mm -hmm. wouldn't allow me to see him. Mm -hmm. which I didn't have the time to go through the court system to be fighting every every year. You know, I was overseas 10 months out of the year. Mm -hmm. The two months I'm home, you know, I wanted to go see my family. Mm -hmm. So it, it was tough for me to go through that. So that process right there, I wish, um, you know, if I, if I could have went through that process and knew a lot of the things about how the system worked before then, because, um, like, once I went overseas, I didn't know that I can go and get, a reduction on my child support, okay. you know, because it was a huge uh, decrease 
in mm -hmm. in, in my pay. Mm -hmm. And so the money kept calculating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if, if I would have knew that, that probably would have stopped me from being incarcerated if I could have uh, went into which I didn't know. So what I'm doing now is just all the experiences and the stuff that, that I got incarcerated for that I didn't know, mm -hmm. that's the information that I'm giving guys now. And I wish I would have knew it better because it probably would have kept me from being incarcerated. Right. Um, it sounds like it gave you your purpose and is a wonderful platform for, it, it, as I said, life beyond the hard, hard, hardwood, life after the, uh, the athleticism. I know a lot of times, whether well, it's a person, a woman dating an athlete or the athlete themselves, people think of glitz and glamour. They don't think of all these other things that are going on behind the scenes, whether it's the person that's with the person, they you know, think it's just all wonderful fantasy and they don't realize that there's a life, there's a person, there's a human being that's playing a sport. It's just not what they're seeing on TV, there's a, there's a person. Um, as that relates to relationships, uh, I wanted to bring up a couple of things and to go into a little bit of Q&A uh, before right. ending, if, that, if that's okay. So this goes back to, you know, you being a, the healed, healed person and, and, and having this platform to help other people. I know you've helped me. I know a time when I thought I was better than I was, I had fussed at you. And I know you had mentioned something about, I came from this dysfunction. I am not doing this. And you asked me to something I learned. So I wanted to bring that up, not to share our business, but to, to point to uh, how, how does what a person, whether it's male or female, how does the environment or the things that they say trigger those early situations or that those underlying things that are really uh, going on in a person's psyche that they're not dealing with? Um, well, I don't have so many different experiences, man. I just know where I am right now and what I don't want. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, you know, you 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 get through those situations, and and you finally at a place where you're at peace. Then you know, it's kind of like with anything when you're going through a healing process. You know, you got to separate yourself from what you don't want. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that was probably one of the key things for me uh, when when you're talking about a relationship, mm -hmm. and like. You got to set boundaries. <laughs> you got to set boundaries and you got to know what it is that you want. Because I think a lot of times going into relationships, people don't know what they want. Mm -hmm. And that's when a lot of the issues come. Because if you don't know what you want, how can anybody else know what you want? Sure. You know, so, so going into that, you know, makes it difficult. If you could just know, you know, what it is that you want out of a relationship, then, you know, that can help a lot, um, you know, with the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any, is there any advice that you would give to others? Uh, I mean, we have a lot of females who enter the professional arena and I believe your daughter is actually aspiring for, <laughs> for a uh, you know, professional basketball as well. Is there, so I want to make sure I keep it gender neutral. Is there any advice that you would give to whether it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, and, and dealing with athletes who've been in your situation or who are currently in your, in your situation, not really getting that help or not dealing with that trauma or dealing with the uh, fall in identity or trying to piece together a, a life in the regular world outside of that professional world. Is there anything that you could uh, give to that person that's with this person? They don't really know what to do, whether they're in the trying to figure it out stage or after the stage that could probably help both parties. Uh, I mean, that's a tough process because the person has to be willing to be able to accept the help, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so so it's always tough, but you always want to be positive and, and uh, you know, I, like I do, I always encourage uh, counseling, you know, because I'm, I'm not, you know, I only can encourage you to go to a professional because I'm not, I'm mm -hmm. not that professional to be able to help you mm -hmm. through your process and I don't try to pretend to be, but I, I can what I can do is speak to you on my experiences and let you know what counseling did for me mm -hmm. to be able to encourage you to be able to do that. But stay positive, uh, stay positive with them and just encourage them, you know, to go seek people or even have a conversation with people that you feel, um, you know, have been through a lot or, or been through similar situations and just be able to have those conversations with them. And you'll be surprised uh, how many phone calls I get where, People that have been going through that from spouses and girlfriends or people like that's been going through or family members that's, you know, they can tell that they've been going through a lot um, for me to just have a conversation. And they was like, well, you know, he says, you know, 
he's not going to those people to talk to them and, and that. And I said, well, let me talk to him. Mm-hmm. And me, you know, just me being transparent because I got so many different stories that I can speak on, you know, and it's rare. I haven't ran into anybody yet that I haven't had some kind of, you know, situation that they've had where I can relate. Mm-hmm. And uh, to be able to have that conversation and tell them, you know, what counseling did for me always can be helpful. Um, and, and I've been probably been like 95 percent on getting people to go to counseling. Mm-hmm. And I think okay. that's tremendous. That's, <laughs> that's that's good, because I know a lot of times, especially you mentioned men, especially African-American men, they frown, they frown on that. And it's really good that you have that that. Did I call it that wounded healer, that gift to be able to not only help, but to bring people to a place to help. Is there anything like a, a place where, whether it's an athlete or someone who's just fallen from a financial situation, a, 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 a moment where you can say, if this is where you are, this is where you should need help. Is there any place that that might be or something that resonates with you and say, okay, if you're, if this is how you're feeling, or if this is what you're doing, this is where you should get intervention. Um, well, it, it's funny. It's, it's funny you even talk about this because, um, uh, I, I never thought that I'd be the guy to speak on finances mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, just off, just off my experiences. And I went to a school and then linked up with an organization called, uh, Money Talks, uh, EDU mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, just had a conversation with them, like that, what they was doing with their organization and what they were doing with the kids and adults on so speaking to them about financial, uh, literacy. And uh, and they asked me to go to school to speak on it. And I'm like, man, I, I can't really speak on uh, financial uh, literacy. And then I get in the class and see, you know, the budgets that they were setting up and, and a lot of this stuff. And I was able to go in and speak on so much uh, on financial literacy. So it's kind of, uh, for me, um, I would say just go into, you know, those organizations that, you know, are professionals in it. You know, all I can do is just give you, you know, I'm not a professional at anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, all I can do is give you advice on the things that I did. Like, like as soon as I got, you know, to a space where I felt good, I, I started doing work with Primerica because I wanted to fi- find out more about finances. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, a financial mm-hmm. group uh, here in uh, Georgia. They're based out of uh, uh, Duluth, Georgia. And, and, I, and, I, and I did work for them for a year just so I could study and be able to get my license to be able to... Um, you know, learn more, you mm-hmm. know, after you lose so much, you know, you want to yeah. go in and make sure once you get it back again, you don't yeah. go through that same path. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, don't, don't get discouraged. You know, always got to keep a, a positive attitude because everybody, I don't care who you are, you're going, everybody going through something financial, you know, mm-hmm. you can be a billionaire and there's not that many of those uh, in the world. So I, I think everybody goes through that financial time. You just got to stay, stay positive and stay encouraged. You know, don't don't let it get you down. But I would definitely um, encourage going to counseling and going to uh, an organization like Money Talks EDU to mm-hmm. be able to get some help because they're that's what they're doing out here is, uh, you know, teaching people about the finances and, and helping them uh, get back to where they want to be. Sure. Could someone contact those organizations through you, through your, your platform? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm partnered with... Um, I actually have to redo my, uh, mm-hmm. I have to redo my, my, my website because I've partnered mm-hmm. with so many people in these past months. I've been yeah. on the go so much. I hadn't had the time to be able to do it myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but as soon as I get an opportunity, all of those, all of those, uh, partners will be on my website. Sure. Now just a few more questions before, before we end the segment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give for men dealing with unresolved trauma? Who might not know where to turn? Like we like we've been talking. Uh, I I think I think far as you're talking with men, I think we need to get together more um, as men because men sharpen iron. You know, mm-hmm. iron sharpens iron, mm-hmm. and I think we need to get to a place where we're transparent to be able to have these conversations. <laughs> I actually. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of this group that I go to every Saturday uh, mm-hmm. just to get that camaraderie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't think of the name of the group right now offhand, but it's a, it's, it's actually um, a group of men mm-hmm. that actually having conversations about, you know, life and, you know, being transparent. It's a safe space. Mm-hmm. And, and for me, like being a professional athlete, you know, I just need the camaraderie of, you know, 
guys being around because people ask me that I miss playing basketball. I was like, no, I just missed the camaraderie. Mm-hmm. So that's my camaraderie to go in in this group and talk with men and and uh, listen to you know guys asking questions and people being transparent about things they went through or things that they experienced. So I just think as men, we just need to be more transparent with each other, man, and being open because we can definitely help each other. And we mm-hmm. just got to be open to that. Um you know, because a lot of and and hang around people that you you know you're inspired by. Like all of my friends inspired me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even from you know high school when we we was coming up, we always inspired each other, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, in different ways we was inspired. And to be able to have those conversations and you know keep each other sharp and, and be transparent because nobody can help you if you're not transparent about mm-hmm. what's going on with you. And, and 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 I understand that it can be hard to be able to be open with a lot of people, but only be open with the people that you're comfortable with. Sure, sure. Uh, as far as mil- mental Ill- illness and suffering through that, is there any uh, thing that someone else might be able to pick up on in their partner uh, that someone may may be able to recognize in dealing with your situation, whether it's they need some time alone or that they really need help? Well, I, I think I think everybody needs time alone. Everybody Mm -hmm. needs that time where, you know, they can be, you know, in a space by themselves. Like people think I'm crazy because I, you know, anytime I'm in that space where I feel like I need to, you know, just get away for a while, I'll get in the car and drive for a couple hours with no music. (laughs) You know, I think Mm -hmm. everybody needs that time, you know, where to themselves to be able to, you know, invest in themselves and, you know, have that quiet time to be able to, you know, if you want to go on the beach or go, go get a massage or something like that, I think that's very helpful. Two more questions. One is, uh, which encouragement do you have for people trying to keep their family together, going through these sorts of situations, whether it's an athlete, somebody falling um, from a financial situation or mental health? Is there anything that um, that you could probably say to encourage someone who, who needs, you know, it's, it's hard dealing with mental illness affairs. It's a tough subject and it's a tough situation. Is there any- Every, every relationship I think needs to have counseling. Mm-hmm. You know, no matter how great you may think, you know, the relationship is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I just think that's just, you know, cause I think everybody goes through something and I think everybody needs to know how to handle it, especially if you have children. Sure. You know, like that's one of the toughest things ever. And, and and one of the things that brought it to light is, uh, you know, my ex-wife was like, uh, like, I know that you was going through so much, but you didn't understand that I was going through it as well. Yeah. And I did because yeah. I always thought it was just me. And, uh, you know, if we would have been going to counseling and being able to have these conversations for me to kind of understand it, um, I think things would have been better as a family. Uh, if that would have happened. So so I would encourage anybody to go through that counseling to be able to have those conversations, um, you know, to make family better, especially with, if you if you got kids around because they can really be affected. And we talk about ACEs, you know, divorce is one of the biggest things where, where kids go into a, a tough funk. So, um, you know, it's really needed to go, go to counseling. For, mm-hmm. for, for couples. Mm-hmm. If you're dating, married, no matter what it is, you want to work on something. Yeah. Because even if you're going into a relationship where you're trying to figure out uh, people, if you, like it's going to take work. Mm-hmm. You know, No matter what kind of relationship you're trying to create for yourself, it's going to take work. So if you're going to do the work, you might as well go to counseling to really yeah. make it if you want to make it work You know, mm-hmm. for that person. Uh, depending on if, if how much you really care about them and how much you want to make it work. Because yeah. you got to really care and love for that person to be able to put the work kind of work that it's going to need. Um, Very true. <laughs> you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. So my last question is, what words would you say to the little boy, the young Jermaine that grew up, that little person inside of you who has endured trauma, knowing all that you had, knowing all that you know now? Um... I, I, w- I would just say just be more open to have conversations, you know, because as a kid, you know, I grew up all the way up until I was almost 40 years old with things that, you know, that was in me mm-hmm. because I hadn't had that conversation as a kid to talk about, it, you know, and that's one of the things I encourage kids about now. You know, if you're going through something at home, you know, everybody had their situation, but, you know, 
be open to have a conversation with, you know, somebody you feel comfortable with in your mm -hmm. family. You know, it don't have to be me. It don't have to be a teacher. It could be somebody in your family. You can have those conversations about, you know, being open about your feelings mm -hmm. and how you feel about things. And I think it's not said enough when it comes to our kids being open, especially young boys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have this stigma where they can't cry. Why? Yeah. why can't they cry you know you know that that's 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 their feelings and i think that's one of the um, biggest stigmas out you know for our for our young kings to be able to have those conversations and, and let it be understood that, that it's okay to cry mm -hmm. i think i cry more now being an adult and being in the space i am i'm in now just having conversations and being transparent you know mm -hmm. i break down in a minute and i'm okay <laughs> with it and i feel good yeah. Like, yeah, give me, I need a hug. Give me a hug. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that if we get to that space where we can be open and transparent, you know, about our feelings as men or, or human beings, you know, I think, you know, a lot of things will be better. Well, thank you so much for taking your time and talking about your experiences and your platform. What is the best means of uh, someone either learning more about what you're involved in, your platform, or contacting you if they want to speaking engagements or contact you for any reason um well if you want to find out more about what i'm doing uh you can go and go on to beyond the hardwood.org mm -hmm. uh, that's my nonprofit organization and if you mm -hmm. want to talk to me about doing speaking engagements or you know coming to churches businesses you know i do a lot talking about teamwork and you know working hard and trying to build an organization as well you can go on to uh, beyond the hardwood.net uh, to be able to set some of those up, uh, have the email and information there for you to be able to, you know, do that. I, of course, I still do camps. <laughs> you know, I'll never be able to get away from, you know, basketball, but the camps that I do is more than just basketball. I like to get in and do the skills and drills and, you know, mentor these kids, but I also like to talk to them, you know, about decision makings because, you know, with the way the world is going right now, uh, you know, I think, all all our youth need some guidance so that's you know that's what i do um like i said beyond the hardwood.net you want that to happen um you want to find out more about what i'm doing i got a lot of stuff lined up it will be on my website soon i gotta update it but it's uh beyond the hardwood.org thank you so much for sharing that information and thank you so much for doing a segment and talking about jermaine jones i appreciate it all right thank you for having me